evening. Want to welcome Rabbi Glasser back to Linden for another, or to kick off our YU Linden speaker series. Always a pleasure to have you. And we have a special treat today because we have Mrs. Glasser, Mrs. Rachel Glasser, and Mrs. Rachel Chernotsky, however you, uh, you know her as, who is here to come back to Linden, as well as listen to her son give the, uh, the cheer for this evening. As I mentioned last time, it's nice that the Glasser family has their roots in Linden. It's also nice that I grew up two blocks away from the Glassers in Los Angeles. So our, our families and our, our connections go way back. And we're doubly grateful for Rabbi Glasser coming out today, a couple weeks before Rosh Hashanah. Obviously, everyone, every rabbi has a busy schedule. Every rabbi is anxious during this time of year. But not only does Rabbi Glasser have to worry about his shul, he also has to worry about the beginning of school at YU. So there's a lot going on. <coughs> and we are really grateful that you took the time to be here today to share Kibbe Torah with us on the topic of tshuva. If there are any of his ba balabatim that are listening, I hope that you'll be able to get this again in a couple weeks as Hazara. That's always important to learn it the second time. I hope that this is something that you will be able to utilize again. We're, we're very thankful that you're here. And the topic for this evening's program is the empowering journey of Teshuva. Rabbi Glass. Okay, thank you very, very much, Rabbi Hess. Um, it's still hard to believe that we ran around the neighborhood at seven years old, and now we're all rabbis in New Jersey. It's harder to believe that we left the West Coast and both took pulpits in New Jersey. That's like really, um, of course, we love New Jersey very, very much. This was a decision that came from passion and neither of us uh, being able to find something on the West Coast. So, the, um, because those rabbis don't believe. The, uh, the, uh, it is a, reg a real privilege and, uh, and a very emotional and wonderful opportunity to be back here learning together with you um, to acknowledge the presence of my mother, who I know some of you know. And uh, it's, uh, like I mentioned last time, it's a, real, it's a real heartwarming opportunity to be able to come back to a place. I remember, actually, I remember spending Rosh Hashanah in this shul when my grandfather passed away because his shiva... Rosh Hashanah ended his shiva early, because uh, he died for only a few days before Rosh Hashanah. And so even though my father is a chazin, and in those years the only person I would ever hear um, would be my father, we ended up in Linden for Rosh Hashanah. And uh, I think I remember sitting in this shul and, uh, and being here for Yom Kippur. So it's really, actually it's amazing that that memory just came back to me right now at this moment, as we're about to have this year, so it's really an amazing uh, circle. Uh, and it's not just a circle, it's a spiral. We keep going up, and Emir uh, Hashem produce many more generations and wonderful uh, nachas for the Linden community. And it's particularly invigorating to just watch the sense of renewal and the sense of uh, growth and the sense of expansion uh, that is not only known in your community, but known about your community in other communities. I have lost members to your community. Uh, so your community holds a very special place in my heart. One of them is sitting here. So, uh, so it's, uh, so yeah, so it's, uh, when people say to me, where do people move to from Passaic, I say Linden and Fairwell. So, uh, so it's, uh, it really is really very special, very special to be here. And, this is a time of year that's not the easiest time of year. I mean, the Jewish people managed to make a holiday season out of guilt. It's really an amazing, <laughs> an amazing accomplishment that we took um, our existential legacy of anxiety and somehow ritualized it um, into an entire season where only the Jewish people could, in the same morning, um, cry about living and dying and wish people a happy new year. Literally, <laughs> in the same morning, you, you spend all day in synagogue and all this is going on, who's going to live, who's going to die, reading through the list, 
you know, kind of asking yourself, I don't really want to go that way or that way or that way or that, right? And then uh, it's all over. We all wish each other a sweet new year, a happy new year. We go home, we eat, we drink. We, it's really, it's an amazing thing. If you think about it, it's a really extraordinary thing. But it's also a daunting time of year. It also can be intimidating. It can also be somewhat overwhelming. Um, I once had the opportunity to meet with the publisher of Art Scroll, you know, the publishing company Art Scroll. And I pitched him, I said to him, I said, I have an amazing idea for a matzer. So he says, what's your idea for the matzer? I said, you should design a matzer where the pages count down. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares that you're up to 256. All we care about is how many pages are left in the matzer, right? And if you are you know, worthy of holding a Hebrew-English matzah, then you can divide by two this night. So it's even greater. We all know that moment. You go out to use the restroom, you come back, they picked up 15 pages. And you're like, really holding. And now there's also sort of shaded areas. My congregation, they always ask me if we say the parts of the matzah, you know, sometimes it says, most congregations add, some congregations add. I told them it's very simple, it's very simple. When it makes it shorter, we're some or we're most. When it makes it longer, we're the other way around. And that's it. It's not an easy season to get through. It's not simple, it's not simple. It's overwhelming, it's challenging, it's a lot of synagogue, it's a lot of shul. It's certainly a lot of the rabbi, and at the end of the day, and the chazin, and the davening, and, and not to mention the goal of the season, which the goal of the season is transformation. The goal of the season is to improve, is to grow. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight, because that's really one of the most magical parts of our religion, if you think about it. The fact that if you are anchored in a secular world entirely, and you transverse the normative secular year, and you go from season to season, there really is no moment in that year where someone stops you and shakes you and say, hey, do you want to be who you are? Do you want to continue living life as you are living it? Do you want to grow? Do you want to improve? Do you want to change? We celebrate all sorts of experiences, right? We, uh, our family, last July 4th, went to, you must do this, we went to a reenactment of the Declaration of Independence. It was in New Jersey, and it, it clicked both boxes for Glasser family outings. Number one, it made the children miserable. That's obviously, when you talk to your teenage children, that's certainly part of your intentionality. And number two, it was free, right? It was free. We went to this reenactment where literally people showed up and they're dressed completely from head to toe as colonialists, it's amazing. I, I see the men with the sheikwach, you know what I'm talking about? With the, with the wigs and everything, and, they're, and a guy comes riding on, on a horse, and he reads the Declaration of Independence, and everybody's cheering and yelling, and it's exciting, it's a reenactment. It's a, it connects you to American heritage, it connects you to a sense of history, it connects you to the ideals that this country stands for, and what it meant to bring forth the independence of a country and all the values that were part of that reality. So in our Jewish calendar, we have one season a year where all of the ideals that we reflect on and we connect to over the period of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the Yom Kippur are true the entire year. It's not that these values don't live as reality the rest of the year. In the middle of March, a person can do true. But there is a component of the year that we consecrate to reflect, to think about, to delve into a little bit. And that is the journey that I want to talk about a little bit tonight. And I want to talk about it in a way that I believe is accessible to everyone. To everyone. Because sometimes when we approach Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we think of this God who's sitting in judgment, in some sort of long robe, and deciding what to do, we think about this season as sort of a time of adjudication, 
We think about, well, there's a very long list of things that we're supposed to do, and God's judging, did we do them, did we not do them? And that, that's true, but at the end of the day, the mandate for us, what we're supposed to walk away with, that's what I want to talk about tonight. What this experience means for us. What our journey of teshuva, which is a word that is um, poorly translated as repentance, and literally should be translated as return, because it presumes, and this is so important, it presumes that everybody's original state is one of goodness and positivity and doing the right thing. And that in life, we don't with intention rebel and violate and throw off the yoke of, of expectation, but rather we get tempted we mistake, we veer, we get distracted, we're a product of our society, we're a product of our upbringing, I had a great upbringing, we're a product <laughs> of our challenges, we're a product of our environment. There are so many different factors that influence our religious behavior. And so when we talk about tshuva, we're talking about returning to that which is real. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. And I actually want to talk about it in the framework of a fascinating halach, a fascinating Jewish law that I'm not sure is one that's applicable in this particular synagogue, but it's a very interesting law, and the law goes like this. It's in the Talmud in Rosh Hashanah in source number one. The Talmud in Rosh Hashanah in source number one says the following. Let's say somebody takes a shofar. The shofar is the iconic ritual object of the season. That's what we're going to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. Obviously, we'll have apples, we'll have honey, we'll have honey dishes that are made by nursery school children. We are to take revenge on the Jewish people. The teachers put in little cracks of the bottom. We'll have the children who insist we bring out last year's honey dishes, which still have residue that attract all sorts of... Obviously, we'll all go through all of that. Obviously, that will be part of the ritual, but the shofar is the main mitzvah of the day. That's the mitzvah that we're going to do. We're going to blow shofar. Do you blow shofar here during the silent shmona esrei? You don't do that, right? So some people do shofar in the silent shmona esrei, in the public shmona esrei. Did you used to? Did you yes. used to? Yes. You used to, right? Absolutely. I remember hearing. I remember that because it's the only time in my life I ever saw it was here, um, and I was nine years old. So wow. So what happens, so I didn't mean to create problems. <laughs> now, I mean, I meant to create problems, but after my shoot. So when I'm gone. Um, so what happens, so the Gemara tells us the following. Oh, you have somebody who's ready to blow shofar. And we know that the call of the shofar is so significant, it's so central to the world of Rosh Hashanah, to the world of Yom No Rome. You know, my shul for three years, we davened in a school because we were building a new building. We had an, I took over, we had an old building. The old building, I like to describe it as sort of like Noah's Ark. It had a floor for people and a floor for animals and a floor for garbage, right? So eventually we knocked that building down, took a couple of leaf blowers and it pretty much came down. And then we built a new building. To build a new building, we moved into a school. We're in the school, we're davening on Rosh Hashanah and schools have bells to tell you when the next period is. So I'm up there, and it's the final blast of the shof, and we're all in the zone. You know what I mean by in the zone? You know, everybody's got their eyes closed, and the singing, and the taluses, and all the kids are in with the Twizzlers coming out of their nose, and <laughs> pump them full of sugar to get them uh, in the shul for Rosh Hashanah, and everybody's totally in the zone, and I call out the final blow to Kia Gidola. And right before the guy could blow, the bell for the school goes off. The whole place cracks up. It took 10 minutes for the guy who was blowing the chauffeur to stop laughing enough that he could position his lips to produce the sound again. 10 minutes, which of course, I got blamed for it in terms of the ending of the service, because that's usually the rabbi's fault. So what happens? This gentleman, this individual who's blowing the shofar, he blows a shofar into a pit. Into a pit. You know the Talmud's full of crazy cases. 
Because in law, when you want to establish precedent and categories and conceptual constructs, you need to extrapolate from cases of the extreme. So that's the nature of the Talmud. The Talmud's always conjuring up these crazy situations. And if you're in sixth grade, you always raise your hand and you're like, who would ever do that? And that's the way to get the rabbi to stop teaching and do something else, right? So the Talmud is always depicting scenarios that are not common in order to illustrate the underpinnings of the law and how they could ultimately be applied in a variety of situations. You can only extrapolate in law from extremes. When something is so specific, when something is so mundane, that can't, so what happens? So this is the halach. So let's say somebody does this. They blow into a pit, or they blow into a cistern, some sort of cavernous area, some sort of cavernous space. What happens when you blow a chauffeur into a cavernous space? What happens if you do anything into a cavernous space? What happens? There's an echo. So says the Gemara, says the Mishnah actually, what's the halacha? So the halacha is, im kol shofar shoma, if you hear the voice of the chauffeur itself, then yotza you are yotze. The im kol havara shoma, but if you hear the voice, not of the chauffeur itself, but the reverberating sound waves off of the cavernous walls of the pit or the cistern or the cave, or maybe even a very, very large synagogue shul, if that's what you hear, lo yatsa, you are not, you do not fulfill the mitzvah of chauffeur. That's the halacha. And the Talmud writes, the Talmud writes, that if you do this, if you blow into the pit, Says the Talmud in the very next section of Rav Huna, the second line, Lo shanu ela lo osan ha'omdim al sasa bora ba osan ha'omdim bibor yatsu. The presumption is, if you're standing in the pit, then maybe some of the sound you're hearing is the echo, but you are certainly hearing the sound of the original <coughs> chauffeur itself. If you're in the room, if you're in the pit, but if they're blowing the chauffeur in the room and you're in the lobby. Are you hearing the chauffeur or are you hearing the chauffeur bouncing off all of these walls and all of these and coming and making its way out to the lobby? Says the Talmud, says the Gemara, you're not noticing. And Me'iri in the 13th century points out that this scenario was actually not theoretical. It was quite practical. Because says the Me'iri, for so many Rosh Hashanahs of Jewish history, Jewish people found themselves in hiding. They found themselves in caves and caverns underground. They found themselves in periods of Jewish history where anti-Semitism reached the threshold that they couldn't practice Judaism in a, uh, in a public way. And so therefore, in order to conceal their observance, they would find spaces to go in hiding. And so therefore, this became very practical. If you were in the pit and you heard the chauffeur in the pit, then you're good to go. You're yo to the midst of shofar. If you're outside the pit and all you're hearing are the reverberations, then one does not fulfill the mitzvah. And in fact, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, in source number three, writes that this is actually the law today as well. If you blow the chauffeur in a pit or in a cave or anywhere of such an environment, if you hear the original chauffeur, you're yotzei the mitzvah. And if you don't, you're not. Now what's difficult to understand about this law, about this halacha, is that when we think about the purpose of the shofar, what's the function of the shofar? Shofar is not just one of these mitzvahs that is sort of like a, a formal, ritualistic, as long as you've checked the shofar box, you're good to go. The shofar is meant to evoke certain feelings, certain experiences, certain memories. The shofar is meant to arouse us out of our slumber, says the rabbi. It's meant to awaken us. It's meant to motivate us, meant to inspire us. The shofar is intended to have a certain existential impact on ourselves. We're meant to react to the shofar. So the question that is posed is, does it really matter if the sound wave you heard if the sound wave you heard emanated directly from the horn of the animal, which itself is sort of like, you know, you're just blowing into this horn of this animal, 
Does it really matter if the sound that you heard was from the horn of the animal or reverberating a little bit off of the walls? Does that really, how does that relate to the point of the shofar itself? Why is that so important? Why does the sound have to be so pure to its source when at the end of the day, it's meant to just evoke certain feelings? It's a musical expression of certain elements, of certain ideas. I'm sure your Rav has spoken in the past, and if not, in the future, about the symbolism of these different sounds. Why we do these different sounds. What, they're, what we're meant to think about when we hear these different sounds. <laughs> the tkiya, the shvarim, the trua, the long, the short, the cry, the wail. But the real goal here is to evoke those emotions, is to internalize the experience. So why are we getting so technical? Why does it matter? where particularly it comes from. And I'd like to answer that question tonight by beginning with something that is as far from Rosh Hashanah as you can get. And that is the anniversary of the moon landing. What happened this past summer, we celebrated 50 years since man landed on the moon, right? Now today, we're not, you know, it takes a lot to impress us today, right? It takes a lot, right? We have more technology in our hand than they had on these spaceships. You know, you can, you know, you may have land a man on the moon. I have eighty thousand songs from Mordechai Ben David. I don't even know how to land a man on the moon tomorrow, right? Not to mention the youth of today. They certainly could put somebody on the moon. They're not impressed by anything, right? A, so, but this was a major achievement, and we know this story began in source number four with an incredible speech by John F. Kennedy, already in 1962, where he challenged the country to step up and rally the engineers and the finding and all the different elements that it would take to ultimately make this happen, to send astronauts to land on the moon. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, but this summer, I took a road trip with our family. We rented a 30-foot RV and we drove from Passaic to Los Angeles. And we spent, it was amazing. It was absolutely incredible, tremendous. And we, we ended up, we ended this trip with the same amount of people we started. Which we consider a major, major accomplishment. So what happened, so we spent Shabbos in Kansas City. Kansas City is like in the middle, right? Everyone there is so nice, too nice. Like you really, kind of, it's a little gross. So what happens, we spend Shabbos in Kansas City and there I met a guy who is a neuroscientist and a mountain climber and he is in training to become an astronaut. That's literally what he's doing, you know? And he is like, his intent to, you know, be part of the United States space program. So what happens? So in 1969, this occurs. What does this have to do with us? Man steps on the moon. One step for man, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It's incredible. It is cataclysmic in terms of the history of human exploration. The, noted, the notion that we could escape the bounds of Earth and our atmosphere and be able to set a human being on another world in this universe was just outrageous. It was just unbelievable. And the whole world reacted to this. Politics reacted to this. Culture reacted to this. The whole world reacted to this. And so did the total world. And in 1969, there was an article that came out in a journal called Noah by a rabbi named Rabbi Ben Zion Fear who posed the following question. If this is going to become a precedent, for the potential future of humanity, that people can travel beyond the bounds of Earth, are people in fact obligated in Torah and mitzvot outside the orbit of this planet? Now, for most people, this was not a practical question, except for maybe Chabad, because they had plans, right? Here they go, right? But, what, but for most people, this wasn't a practical question. But he answered this question in a shocking way. He answered this question, this comes from the article, and he basically says, the Torah tells us 
in the second paragraph of the article. These are the statutes, these are the laws that you have to do in the land that I'm going to give you, that I promised your forefathers. That you are living on this earth, on this land. Says Rabbi Fear, what do you see from this verse in the Torah? That when you're living in the bounds of normative physical existence here on planet earth, you are governed by the expectations of Judaism's framework for a religious lifestyle of Torah and mitzvot. Once you position yourself in some sort of other world, you just stop out. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about tefillin. You don't have to worry about Shabbos. You don't have to worry about synagogue dues. You don't have to worry about, you know, you don't have to worry about anything. The Torah was given to people living in this world, to people living on this terrestrial reality. If you're going to somehow establish your reality in some other world, it's irrelevant to you. That's not what God, God gave the Torah for this world. This question came up when Ilan Ramon, right, of blessed memory. So that shuttle disintegrated on its re-entry, not its, its spent time in space. And as a representative of the Jewish people, he wanted to keep a Shabbos. So he posed the Shiloh, when do I start Shabbos, right? When do I start Shabbos, right? For the men in the room, the question is, what of the 18 minutes could I shower at like minute 16.5? He needed to know, like, when do I, you know, when's the bottom line, when Shabbos? And this went, this Shiloh went all over the world. Does it go based on Cape Canaveral? Does it go based on Houston? Does it go based on Israel? Where does it go based on? That was a big, interesting question. But that was the opinion of Rabbi Fir. When Rabbi Menachem Mendel Kasher in 1969 heard this assertion that Torah and Mitzvot doesn't apply outside this world, he penned a book, a book that is titled Ha'adam Al Hayareach, Man on the Moon. It's a 300 page safe. It's a 300 page book, right? Because rabbis could write 300 pages about anything, right? <laughs> Shenders, 300 pages with footnotes, right? <laughs> anything, they could make, make problems. So what happens? He writes a 300-page book, of which there is an excerpt in source number seven, in which he argues fundamentally with Rabbi Fir. And he says to him the following, that Judaism and your obligation in Torah and mitzvot is unrelated to what planet you're on because those obligations live within the individual. And the individual is the source of those chiyuvim, of those obligations. It is what he calls a chovas hagavra, which means they are obligations of the person. And it is irrelevant where that person finds themselves. They could find themselves here, on the moon, anywhere. Wherever a person is, the Torah relates to them. So I'd like to analyze this, this, this debate for a second. What kind of debate is this? What kind of machlok is this? Now, how often do you ask your rabbi a question, right? And the rabbi say, oh, it's a big debate, right? It's a big machlok, I gotta get back to you, right? That's what we say when we don't know the answer, <laughs> right? So what happens, right? There's a big debate. So what is this debate? What are you arguing about? If there are mitzvahs on the moon, if there are no mitzvahs on the moon, what a ridiculous, this is a discussion in 1969? Like, uh, maybe they didn't have internet, so they had nothing to do. I don't know, like, what are you, what are you debating? So what they're debating is something very fundamental. And that is whether or not you view Judaism and a total way of life as reactive to your environment and the world around you. In other words, God created a world. And that world, that context, that landscape, that reality generates certain expectations of behavior from people, from us. And we were told that when we engage that landscape, this is what we have to do. But the ultimate source of our commitment, the ultimate source of our mandate to live life with the values and ideals and expectations and rituals of Judaism ultimately emanates from the environment around us. It is the world, it is the context that generates these obligations. That's Rabbi Fuhrer's position. Rabbi Kasha felt completely different. He said that the mandate of man to live their life in accordance with the dictates and the values of Torah 
is not reactive to the world around them. It emanates from the individual themselves. That God put man in this world not to react to it. God put man in this world to shape it, to control it, to move it, to progress it, to influence it, to impact it. That the mandate to change, the mandate to grow, comes from us. And this is so relevant to the realm of Teshuvah. Because how do we relate to our mandate to look at our lives and contemplate how we can improve during the season of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? <clears throat> do we view this process as essentially an externally driven process? We're in a certain time of year, we're in a certain context, we're saying certain <coughs> prayers, we're hearing certain chauffeurs, we're listening to certain speeches, and I'm going to decide if I want to get on board or if I want to lay back and not engage. I'm going to decide, do I want to react and respond to a context of change or do I want to just allow myself to be passive in terms of how I'm going to relate to the reality around me? That's one paradigm. The other paradigm views this entire season differently. And that is, it's not about the synagogue. It's not about the chauffeur. It's not about the speeches. It's not about all of the external accoutrements. It is about what starts within us. It is about reaching the authentic, sincere, real, true depths of who we are. It's about peeling away all of our life experiences and all of our different temptations and all of our habits and all of the ways in which we've become so entrenched in how we think about things, and how we do things, in how we relate to certain people, in how we've defined those around us, individuals, families, ideologies, communities. And it's about recognizing that at the end of the day, the process of tshuva is the process of reaching your authentic self. It's about reaching that God. It's about discovering the true calling it's about trying to remove all of the distraction and the noise that life generates, that these external realities generate. And all of these things, the synagogue, the chauffeur, the learning, all of these things are designed to create the context within which we can find ourselves. We're not reacting to these things. We're not responding to chauffeur. Chauffeur is creating an environment where we generate the reality that we are trying to shape. We are trying to reach our authentic selves. And our Salavichik explains this so beautifully when he talks about the chauffeur itself. Because think about what the chauffeur is. The chauffeur is this instrument from this animal. And what do we do to create this voice of the chauffeur? We blow into the instrument. So my Salavichik points out that when God created man, the Torah tells us, How did God, first God formed the physicality of man. But how did God infuse that physicality with a, with a soul? What does it say? God blew into the body of man a soul. It says Rabbi Salvechik, that soul, that moment, is the real you. It's the authentic you. It's the unadulterated you. It's the unencumbered you. It's the you that's not responding and reacting to expectations around you. It's the real you. And the whole experience of Shofar is to emote that primordial being that's inside that God infused within us to express it into our environment, to bring it to life, to summon from within us the true and authentic and real will of who we are and to allow that to become the directing guidance of where we lead our lives. So when we emerge from Yom and Noraim and when we emerge from the experience of Tshuva, it's not about responding and reacting and hitting our, our uh, you know, chest 5,000 times with the list that we get in the Machser, which I don't know about you, but that list 
I've gotten more ideas for sinning from that list than I ever would have come up with on my own. I, if I had to make a list of sin, I don't know, I'd come up with like 10 or 15. I'm like, and now the, the commentaries, they give you even more, you know, more, oh, it includes this and this. Oh, I didn't know user reaction. I didn't, you know, like I, it's like amazing. It's not just about responding and reacting. It's about discovering, rediscovering the true self. And the presumption is that that true self is an authentic, real, good person. And so if we, just on a very practical level, if we find ourselves you know, not able to get along with other people, the process of tshuva is not just the process of going over to them and saying, are you welcome? You forgive me, right? Or the way we do it today, right? As of five years ago, you, you email them. And so three years ago, you text them, right? Now, if you want forgiveness from someone, you just generate some sort of smiley, contorted face. And that is considered a very eloquent expression of your thoughts and feelings, right? That's a serious expression of your thoughts and feelings, right? Will you mocho me? LOL. Okay, I guess we're good to go. Got that thought, right? What's it really about? What it's really about is saying to yourself, what are the contexts and factors and experiences and situations and histories that are holding back us two good people from being able to actualize what Judaism asks of us, which is to create peace and harmony in our community? What's holding that back? Because if I look really deep inside, past my political allegiances, past my experiences with this person, past my assumptions about their intentions, past the ways in which they've disappointed me, if I can pass all of that and discover and rediscover an authentic and real and pure reach for goodness, then you can begin to reconstruct a relationship in a very real way. If you try to solve every problem, that becomes very challenging, that becomes very difficult. And that's why you look at source number nine, the Rambam, Maimonides writes, the Rambam writes, and it's an amazing point, when the, Maimonides introduces the laws of repentance, Maimonides was one of the first people in Jewish history to compose an actual practical guidebook on how to do repentance. Not just waxing poetic about nice ideas and inspiration, Practical, bottom line, how do I do this? <clears throat> and in his opening, in his opening law, the first thing he says is, you know what is the secret? You know what's the foundation? You know what's the key to repentance? He says the key to repentance, I would think change, I would think commitment, I would think regret. The Maimonides says confession. Confession. Mitzvah lehisvados. Chayev lehisvados. Tshuva, says the Rambam. When you want to do tshuva, when you want to repent, chayiv lihisvados. Chayiv lihisvados, confession. Uh, without a big confession religion, right? I don't have uh, congregants coming to my office saying, you know, let me tell you what I did wrong. In fact, I think in our community, we have the opposite. <laughs> you come to my office to tell me what I did wrong, right? That's our form of being doing. No, I brought a list, right? I brought a list. Well, what's confession? This is what we do? This is what, oh, you know, I confess, I confess, I confess. What is that? Says the rabbi, I'll tell you what it is. It's being authentic. It's being real. It's being true to who you are. Confession is not some sort of ritual of delineation of things we did wrong. Confession is not about getting it off our chest. Confession is about confronting the authentic who we are. Confession is about being honest with ourselves. We can't change and we can't grow as people if we're not honest with ourselves. Confession is the foundation of tshuva, not for its ritual value, it's the foundation for tshuva because we can't go anywhere without honesty, without authenticity, without looking in the mirror and saying, where are we? Where are we for real? Not to allow ourselves to be self-deceptive and, and, and come up with all sorts of rationalizations about where we are, 
Confession means, you know what? I did something wrong. I didn't do as much as I could. I could, I could fix this relationship. I played a role. I may not be at fault. I contributed. I could come to synagogue more. I could connect to the study of Torah more. I could make a little bit of an improvement in my connection to the Shabbat. I can make a little bit of an improvement in my connection to other Jewish values and Jewish experiences. Tshuva means, mean you, you make a list of everything you did wrong and start beating yourself up. It means that you open up, in reality, you just, you begin to confront, you begin to be honest with yourself. It begins with honesty. And says the Rambam, that's what it means. And in fact, what's really fascinating is if you look at the tour, which is in source number 12, we have an amazing, amazing custom that we start in Elul. In the beginning of Elul in Shul, we blow the shofar. And this is a very peculiar custom because in most mitzvot that we do, we do not like to um, sort of like do them in anticipation in a way that kind of like blows the whole thing, right? With Pesach, right? There are so many different customs when to stop eating matzah before Pesach. The Mishnah writes, certainly the day of Arab Pesach, you're not supposed to eat matzah. That's not just for digestive reasons. That's for, you know, that, that's not a gastro, you know, advice. That's a, that's a halacha. That's a, why? Because you're supposed to create teyot, anticipation, excitement, enthusiasm. So of course, the Mishnah said not to do it the day before Pesach, so that became the week before, that became the month before, then it's Purim, then it's Hanukkah, then it's Sukkot, then it's like three years in advance, you don't wanna, you know? Then it's like from conception, do not touch matzah. Okay, because we're, we're crazy. But the bottom line is, why do we do all that? Because we're trying to create a certain buildup, a certain sense of excitement. You know, the chauffeur is supposed to be magical and amazing. But anybody who's dominating in a morning minion is hearing it every day for 30 days. Why are we doing that? So the Medrash tells us the reason why we blow the chauffeur in El is to commemorate a historical event. What's the historical event? You know that when Moshe comes down from the mountain, he sees the people with the Torah, with the tablets, he sees the people dancing with idolatry, with the golden calf. Right? Why? Because they anticipated his return at a certain point in time. He didn't come on time. This is the beginning of Jewish time. And all of a sudden, right, instead of saying to themselves, oh, the wedding was called for five, and here we are at 7.30 still waiting for the chuppah. Okay, that's how weddings go. The people completely freak out, and they build a golden calf. Moshe sees the golden calf, breaks the luchos. God says he's going to destroy the Jewish people. Moshe appeals on their behalf. God says he's going to forgive them. And then God says to Moshe, okay, come up again. And now the Medrash paints a picture. He says, could you imagine what the feeling was amongst the people? Here we have the exact same circumstance. Again, we have Moshe going up the mountain. We have all of the same imagery. We have all of the same context. We have all the same temptations. We have all the same and a history of failure. And what happens? So says the Medrash that they blow the chauffeur in the camp. Why do they blow the chauffeur in the camp? So that people will not make the same mistake again. What are you blowing the chauffeur? What does the chauffeur have to do with people not making the same mistake again? The point of the chauffeur was that people could reach their authentic selves so that they could understand and they could realize that this temptation, this external circumstance that resulted in this total aberration of what should have ultimately happened does not define who they are. That they're good, that they're righteous, that they're real, that they're faithful. That that's fundamentally the core of who they are. That they really do want to do the right thing. The purpose of the chauffeur is not to frighten them. The purpose of the chauffeur is to say to them, listen to the essence of who you are. Don't listen to the noise. Don't get distracted by the environment. Don't get distracted by the circumstance. Reach the essence of who you are. And that, my friends, is why we have to hear the call, the voice of the chauffeur itself and not. Because the purpose of the chauffeur is not to create some sort of sound. 
that is ritualized into some sort of process that somehow evokes a movement of repentance. The purpose of the chauffeur is to penetrate the essence of who we are. It's to get us to just close our eyes and face ourselves. And so it cannot be produced based on context because context and environment is the antithesis of its message and its purpose. Context and environment is what we're trying to transcend. Context and environment is what gives rise to temptation and distraction and mistakes. What's in the essence of a person is a drive and a reach to be good and to do the right thing. And so the chauffeur has to be earned in its authentic form from the genuine chauffeur itself. And in fact, Maimonides writes, and it's an amazing point, he writes that if a person really wants, he writes it's in Source 13, if a person really wants to effectuate tshuva gemura, which means final tshuva, Maimonides writes, you know what you have to do? You have to somehow find yourself in the actual situation again and then prove that you don't fall, right? That's a very strange barometer. Is that really the advice we want to give people? If someone's struggling with promiscuity, that's actually the Rambam's suggest, that's actually his example. His example is, yeah, you know, you, what you want to do is you want to go to the same place in Vegas and you want to find the same person and the same, really, that's a good idea? I don't know that that's a good idea. I wouldn't recommend that. What is the Rambam saying? What does it mean you find yourself in the same circumstance? What he's saying is that true repentance is when you are able to not be defined by the environment and the circumstance itself, when you're able to decide what happens next. When you're able to summon from within yourself a decision. And that decision, that choice, which is a good choice and the right choice, becomes an expression and a manifestation of the true reality of who you are. And that reality, that soul, that's the soul that God gave you that he created you with. And that's the soul that God gave you to take this journey of life with. And sometimes that journey is complicated and compromising and difficult and challenging. And sometimes we fall and we fail and we disappoint and we get disappointed. And all of that is true. And what Shula is about is about a recalibration that returns us to the authenticity of where it all began. Of a recognition that we are fundamentally good. And that part of this is not about fighting the environment. It's about transcending the environment. It's about finding ourselves. And so therefore, yes, we set up the exact same circumstance so that the only thing that changes is us and what we do. And that's exactly what happened that day when Moshe goes up the mountain. The Jewish people are faced with the exact same circumstance. And yet they behave differently because that chauffeur has helped them reach themselves. And there is an amazing um, Gemara, there's an amazing story that's told in the Gemara in Abot Zal. The Gemara tells a story about a man named Rabbi Lazar ben Dudoy. Rabbi Lazar ben Dudoy was known as a professional sinner. He was amazing at it. He was literally incredible. His mother used to kvel, right? <laughs> Nobody sins like my little Elazar Luka, right? He's amazing at it. He's so tremendous at it. He finds every imaginable sin. And you know the Talmud. It colors this up in quite you know, profound imagery. So the Talmud tells a story that he found himself in a very compromising situation with a, um, a, a, a scenario with a woman that he should not have found himself in. And this woman of ill repute herself made a comment as they were engaging in this sin that basically said to him, look at you, look at you. You're lost, you're nothing, you're, you're worthless. You have no value, look at you, sitting here with a look at, look at you, right? So he didn't say to her, well, look at you. No, that's not what he said. He, he, somehow that hit him. Somehow it hit him that he had hit rock bottom. And the Talmud says, the Gemara says, that what he did was, and it's right here in source number 14, he went to various expressions of nature. And he went to the sun and the moon and he said, Bikshu alai rachamim. Sun and the moon, right? Appeal for mercy on my behalf. 
mountains and hills appeal for mercy on my behalf and all of these different entities respond to him we can't appeal for you we're busy dealing with us the son's like you want me to deal with you i have my own problems i have my own issues the hills and the valleys we, 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 we can't daven for you we have our own issues we have our own problems they all resist and the gemara says every loser men do die Ask all over nature, appeal for me, appeal for me, appeal for me. And finally, he realizes, he turns inwards and he says the immortal words, Ein hadaper talui ela bi. Which means the matter, the matter of transformation is only dependent on me. And the Talmud says that he engaged in such deep and profound regret and prayer that he actually ended up losing his soul because he became so intensely engaged in the process of truth. Asks the commentaries, what is this weird story? Going to different pieces of nature and asking them to intervene on your behalf. What is that? So answers the Maharal. The Maharal answers that I'll tell you what it is. It represents what we all do. We all pin our issues on others. We all essentially ascribe our faults and failures to outside circumstances, to other people, to the situation, to the society, to the issue. This is what we do, this is what we love to do. It's, it's society, it's the values, it's the this, kids today, all these, the, this is what we love to do. Ain't hadaver totally ever be, says the man. You wanna know how to be an instrument of change. You wanna know how to grow in this world. You wanna know how to emerge at the end of your life feeling like you made an impact and you made a difference, reach the essence of who you are. Ain hadover toloi ella bi. And I'll share with you such a beautiful, in Source 16, such a beautiful depiction from Rabbi Salavachi. When he talks about the individual, when he talks about the individual, you know, our religion is so focused on family and on community that sometimes we lose sight of the grandeur with which Judaism relates to the power and the capacity of the individual. And says of Salavechik, Judaism believes that every individual is capable of qualifying himself for divine service. Rich and poor, genius and simpleton, master and slave. They are all fit to serve God in some capacity. Every person possesses something unique by virtue of which he differs from the vow, making him or her irreplaceable and indispensable, the inner worth of a one-timely, unique, never-to-be-duplicated existence which can and must serve God by self-involvement in the drama of redemption at all levels. Says Rabbi Salavechik, the greatness of every individual human being. What this season is about is not about figuring out what's wrong with us. Everything is right with us. It's about figuring out what is wrong around us, to us, with us, near us, in front of us. Because the us itself, in a double totally LB, we have enormous contribution to make. The authentic self, that self that we reach through the piercing cry of the chauffeur, through the penetrating experience of opening ourselves up to the authenticity of who we are, through the honesty of looking at our lives and looking at where we're holding and where we find ourselves, that is the real us. And the period and the experience of tshuva is about finding a way for that piece of us to emerge. I shared with you that we went on this amazing trip. So, so first of all, um, we're driving this 30-foot truck, and we slept in RV parks. Now, to tell you, there are very few people from Passaic that you run into in an RV park. <laughs> there, I mean, you know, there, there really. There, I would think that we were the first Orthodox Jews that most of these people had ever seen in their whole life. And we went sleeping from RV park to RV park. Now, first of all, everyone is so nice. I mean, I have to tell you, this country, I would say from Pittsburgh to Phoenix, is all nice. Everybody's nice. 
And you show up there and everybody wants to help you and everybody wants to, you know, because you can imagine like these guys roll in and they look like they know what they're doing with the RVs. I'm like in a suit and tie. <laughs> you know, the guy's like, I don't think you want to turn that knob. And I'm like, why not? He's like, that's the black water knob. <laughs> I'm like, I think I'm supposed to put it in the thing. And he's like, yeah, I don't think you really know what you're doing. Why don't I help you with this? Now, he was very drunk, but he was incredibly helpful. And this is where we stay in these places and we met crazy people and fascinating people and amazing people. It was an amazing, amazing experience. But I'll tell you one of the top moments of the experience. So we're going across the United States of America and we reach a state called Utah. You ever been to Utah? Okay. So Utah has these national parks, which are just, they are unbelievable. They are just unbelievable. Now you're talking about a family, like the closest thing we've ever seen to nature is like Patterson Falls. <laughs> and that was like a major family trip. And it was like, we have pictures in front of that fall. And we have like, literally that's the closest we've been. And these places are just, they're unreal. They're majestic. They're just, you think the Grand Canyon times 100. It was really the first time in my life I ever got emotional looking at nature. It was just unbelievable. My nine, my 10 year old, <laughs> my 10 year old who couldn't stop like reacting to it. It was amazing. And we went river rafting in it and we went, so there's this place in Utah called Bryce Canyon, mm -hmm. okay? Bryce Canyon is, it's indescribable. It's indescribable. It's, so my daughter, um, the 10 year old, hurt her foot on the trip. So my wife and the other kids went hiking into the canyon. Mm -hmm. And we stayed up on top at this area called Sunset Point. And from Sunset Point, you could see mm -hmm. like the whole panorama of Bryce Canyon. And it's indescribable. So we're standing up there, and we have like a half hour to kill up there. And once we looked at it, and we took our selfies, and we took our pictures, and we you know, appreciated it and everything like that. And so what did I do for the next half hour? I stood there and I watched other people walk up to Sunset Point, and I watched their reactions as they looked out at it for the first time. Because I know what my reaction was. And I stood there and I watched person after person react to this. I watched 15 people. 14 out of the 15 people in the words that came out of their mouth when they saw this was the word God. <laughs> now there is no way statistically that 14 out of 15 Americans sitting in a national park would describe themselves as God believing. It's just not where our country is. That's just not reality. But when you see something like this, there's nothing else to say. You have literally removed all of the cynicism, all of the skepticism, all of the experiences of your life that nothing, there's nothing else. All you see is the grandeur of God and what comes out, what comes out is what's real. And what's really inside is a godly person. He's a godly person who's grown up in a certain way, who's been exposed to certain things, who's a product of society, who's engaged in certain, but what really are we as human beings? We're godly people. We were all created in the image of God. And when we see God for real, we see him. And it comes out. It was like a chauffeur. It was amazing because that's what it means to reach the essence of who we are. That's what it means to penetrate to the authenticity, to the call, to the truth of who we are. And that's the real journey of truth. It's a positive, optimistic, forward-moving, amazing, exhilarating journey. It's not a fearful, boring, you know, self-deprecating journey. It's a journey that begins with honesty, and then it's a journey that says, let's find the essence of who we are. Let's rediscover our nature. Let's return. That's what it means. 
Let's return in the framework, if we're blessed to be in a marriage, let's try to return to the origins of that framework without all of the challenges and distractions and things that came up in our life. In relationships with parents, let's try to return to the authenticity of that relationship. In our relationship with God, let's try to return to the essence, to the purity of what that is before all those complications. Of course we contend with them, we deal with them, we confront them, that's what Vidui is. But at the end of the day, the journey of tshuva is a journey back to our original selves. This is what Rav Kook's entire work, Oros HaTshuva, is about. It's about positioning Teshuva as a return to our authentic self. And our authentic self is good. It's great. It's amazing. And it's performed amazingly in many, many circumstances. And this is the time of year where we allow ourselves to step forward and say, that's who we want to be. That's who we really are. And then you look at God and you say, judge that. Judge that. Don't all this other stuff, it's noise. Because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. I'm dealing with it. You want to judge something? Judge that. Because that's who we really are. The good, authentic, real, holy, glowing people. And that ultimately is our individual and collective journey of truth. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.